Thank you very much. It's my first time in Moscow. Thanks for the invitation. I'm having a great time. It's a wonderful city, a true megalopolis, as we would say in Greek. So I will, um, in fact, uh, slightly change the title to Nam's uh, Modularity Conjecture. which is now a theorem ten days old. I believe not even Werner Nam knows about it. Nam or Nam? What is the last letter? Yeah. Sorry. Okay, and it is joint work with Frank Caligari. and Don Zagir. So, the story goes as follows. In about 1993, um, Nam was studying Vira Soro characters of rational conformal field theory and predicted a relationship between modularity properties of certain Q hypergeometric series and um, torsion elements in K theory, algebraic K theory of number fields. Now, you may wonder if you're sitting in the wrong conference, but you're not. Okay? So, um, these certain Q hypergeometric series. In the rank one case, they take the following shape. They depend on three integers or maybe rational numbers. So let me just write the formula for them. So there are two hypergeometric series of this kind where quantum n factorial is a familiar symbol. And A is a positive uh, rational number, so A, B, C are rational numbers with A positive, so that this series is actually at least makes sense as a formal power series with integer coefficients in one variable Q. Well, you multiply it by Q to the C if, if C is not necessarily a, an integer number. So they are formal power series with integer coefficients, and they are also analytic functions inside the complex unit disk. Okay, these are the special Q hypergeometric series I am talking about, and we call them num sums. Okay, so these are the num sums. Well, I'll be talking about modularity properties of these types of num sums. So, curiously, hypergeometric series of this kind have appeared recently in quantum topology in at least two different contexts I know of. One context, so they appeared recently in quantum topology in two different contexts. One is something called stability of the coefficients of the color Jones polynomial. So if you look at the color Jones polynomial, it is a sequence of polynomials. They are Laurent polynomials, but if we shift them so that they all start with one, 
if that is possible, then they then they start having coefficients, and the coefficients sort of grow, but they stabilize. That is some, uh, so it's usually called the tail or the head of the color Jones polynomial, and the fact that the coefficients stabilize is a result of Tang Le and myself, and also um, some alternative work was done by Oliver Dasbach. And the, the stabilization of these coefficients leads to series of this kind. So that is uh, one instance. Another instance is they appear in something called the 3D index of an ideally triangulated three manifold in the work of the physicists Gaiotto, uh, uh, no, no, Dimofte, Gaiotto, and Gukov, and also in, in, in some work of uh, myself and uh, three Australians. Hodge and Rubinstein and Segerman. Okay. I'm not, I, I, I can tell you later what it means. It means you have one, one minus Q and more terms, one minus Q, you know, minus Q squared and more terms, and, and, and this. So what? For alternating nodes, and the color of polynomial alternating. Yes, when the parameter of the sequence goes to infinity, they sort of diagonally stabilize like that. Okay, so so num sums have appeared, and in fact, we call them num sums in the paper with Tan. Um, let me give you an example, so that uh, um, we have something concrete. So I'll give you an example of a series. All I need to give you is an A and a B and a C, and then we have a series, right? So it's not so hard to get one. So here's an example. A series G, which is the sum of Q n squared over quantum n factorial. Now I see there's a trick here. Oops. Hmm. Quantum n factorial. Right? So this is the case when a is equal to 2. Okay? Honest enough? This particular series can actually be written as a product when it's congruent to plus or minus 1 mod 5 of 1 over 1 minus q to the n. And uh, that can also be written as uh, this way. Where x q infinity is the product of 1 minus x q to the k from 0 to infinity. OK. Um, this identity here? that an infinite sum is equal to that particular product is not such an obvious identity. It is an identity discovered by Ramanujan. Ramanujan discovers seven such identities, and I'm telling you the very first one. OK, so we have a series, which is a sum, but it is also written as a product. And now you can use um, Known Western mathematics, meaning the, tri the Jacobi triple product identity. So once it's written like a product like that, which is product of two stuff, you can complete it, make it a product of three stuff, and the product of three stuff is actually this, where now I'm summing over all integers, minus one to the n, q to the five, n squared plus n 
divided by 2. You may say, so what? Well, now I'm summing over integers. And when you're summing over integers, q to the quadratic form plus linear form, this is well known that the, the numerator is actually a modular form of weight 1 half. I will tell you in a moment what that means. The denominator is also a modular form of weight 1 half. And uh, therefore, the ratio is just a modular function. And what is a modular function? A modular function is 1. Here's a definition. We say that f of z, which is defined to be um, this function, z in the upper half plane, imaginary z positive, we say that this is a modular function if, if it transforms um, it is invariant under uh, fractional linear transformations where A, B, C, D are in a group gamma, which is a subgroup of SL to Z uh, of finite index. Typically, you just take the full subgroup of SL to Z. So therefore, this particular sum is a modular function. And I said that Nance modularity conjecture relates non sums which happen to be modular functions with some torsion elements in K theory. So let me remind you a little bit, but maybe gently, what I mean by K theory. So if you take the sum here and replace n by n plus 1 and divide it by this, you want the ratio to be 1. And that is q to the 2n plus 1, I believe, over 1 minus q to the n plus 1, right? And if you call q to the n equals capital Q, and uh, this is anyway approximate, and q is about, little q is about 1, then you get q squared over 1 minus q. Therefore, you get an identity, or an equation, rather, an equation that says 1 minus q is q to the a for the general non sum, capital A is equal to 2 in this case. So this is an algebraic equation, a polynomial equation. And in our case, when A is equal to 2, it has two solutions. The two solutions are the well-known. What? What is happening? Yeah, what is happening? Well, what is the problem? One is about this, which is equal to this, which is equal... I'm telling you how to define an identity, I mean, a polynomial equation out of an ensemble. Yeah, because somehow the asymptotic expansion of this sum will be at points where the ratio of two terms is above of equal magnitude. This is supposed to be a heuristic um, explanation of this polynomial equation. If you don't like it, ignore it. Right? So when x is equal to 2, this is a, pol a quadratic polynomial equation that we all know how to solve. Um, and the solution is this. Now you may have seen that 5 plays a special role here. Although I started with a is equal to 2, some 5 actually appears. And in fact, of the two solutions here, there is actually only one Galois orbit. 
But of the two solutions, there is a unique solution, a unique solution, um, Q is equal to minus 1 plus root 5 over 2 in the interval 0, 1. Okay, and why is there a unique solution? Because when Q is equal to 0, the left hand side is 1. When Q is equal to 1, left hand side is 0. So left hand side goes between 1 to 0. Right hand side goes between 0 and 1. They merge somewhere, intermediate value theorem, and only once because after they merge, one goes up, one goes down, and there's a unique, there's a unique solution. That solution is the distinguished solution to Nam's equation. So this is called Nam's equation. And Nam's equation has a distinguished solution. OK. So now I have to say something about K-theory. In fact, something about the block group. Okay. All right. Block group. Block group B of F of a number field F, which in our example. In our example here, it was q square root of 5, right? <clears throat> OK, so it's defined using symbols. So first, we look at the set of all linear combinations. So these are formal linear combinations with integer coefficients of elements, of non-zero elements of the number field. And you map this into the second exterior power of f star under the map that sends the linear combination of the element x to x wedge 1 minus x. And then we take the kernel of that map. So this is an not finally generated abelian group. It has one, it's a free abelian group with one generator for every non-zero element of the number field. If the number field is the rational numbers, so for every non-zero rational number, you get one generator. There are some relations. It has a kernel, um, and there are some there are some special elements in the kernel, and those special elements they have a name. They are called the five-term relation. So the five-term relation says the following. If x and y are elements of the number field, think rational numbers, for example, then this combination here x and y, this combination is always in the kernel. You can actually check that. And the quotient by this uh, subgroup generated by this five-term relation is defined to be the block group. Block in about 1978. Now, five-term relation at least is familiar. Pentagon. Think about Renat Kashaev. That's. Every time I hear Pentagon, I don't, that's what I think, at least. <clears throat> OK, so now, if I have my solution Q, my distinguished solution to Nam's equation, I get an element which I call C, um, which is bracket Q, which is an element of the block group. And at least I have to convince you that bracket Q is indeed in the kernel of this map. Because not any linear combination is an element of block, block group. It has to be in the kernel. So why is it in the kernel? Because Q wedge 1 minus Q is Q wedge Q to the A. How are we going to simplify? 
Remember, F star is the multiplicative group. So, whatever wedge means, you know, I'm talking about the wedge where it is multilinear with respect to the multiplication, not with respect to addition. And the Q wedge Q, um, I mean, well, it's always zero. Okay, so this is an amino group group. Okay. So, now I can, I have all the ingredients to formulate Nam's conjecture. Nam's conjecture says that if a num sum is modular, then the element of the block group is torsion. Uh, what kind of uh, group is the block group? Well, it's an abelian group, right? It's a it's a sub quotient of a free abelian group. So it's an abelian group. So it can have torsion. Uh, but the way that I have defined it, it's not at all clear that the, the block group is finitely generated or anything like that. So now I need to tell you some theorems about the block group. Okay, this is the condition. And the theorem is that it's true. Okay? Any questions about that? I guess no question. So let me tell you some properties of the block group. In fact, I'm not really going to use the definition anymore. But I'm going to use some properties. Okay, so here are structural properties that we need to know. First is the theorem of Suslin. Andrei Suslin, I suppose, right? The block group is isomorphic to the algebraic K theory group of the field, modulo, well understood, six torsion. I'm not going to bother with the six torsion. The, uh, this is an algebraic number. It generates a number field. Is well understood a mathematical term or just? Excuse me? Well understood. Is it actually? Yeah, it is very well understood. When I give you a polynomial equation like this and I find a real solution in the interval 0, 1, that is an algebraic number. A is rational. So that is a polynomial equation. It defines a well-defined algebraic number, and that number generates a number field. So oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. But I don't want to get that. It has to do with the difference between ordered triangulations that people like, some people love, and unordered triangulations that other people. So an ideal tetrahedron has a symmetry group of order six that does relate for this torsion. So, yeah. yeah. You can, you can say there are no holes. No holes. Don't worry. Just don't worry about the six torsion. Don't pick up on six torsion, please. And then there's a theorem of Borel that says that K3 of a number field is finitely generated, finitely generated abelian group. Oops, I'm very sorry. Of rank R2, where R2 is the number of pairs of complex embeddings of F. So in particular, if our number field is Q square root of 5, how many complex embeddings does it have? It 
It has real embeddings. This is a subfield of the real numbers. How many complex embeddings does it have? None. Okay, so R2 is zero. Okay, so this is a finitely generated abelian group of rank zero, otherwise known as a finite abelian group. Yeah, but non-trivial necessarily. Okay, so this is a theorem for L. Okay, so if you put the two things together, so at least the obstruction, it says that if it's modular, then um, it's going to be a torsion element in a finitely generated abelian group. If that abelian group was torsion, then of course it's obvious, but if, if not, then not. Okay, so um, actually, Nunn's conjecture was conjectured not only in the case of rank 1, which is not that interesting and in fact known already, but in arbitrary rank. Now, what do I mean by arbitrary rank? Um, so, here's what I mean by arbitrary rank. Um, I have, an, so this is a symmetric R by R matrix, and this is now going to be a multi-dimensional sum of Q to the one half N A and T and B and C over the product. Okay, this is just the usual multi-dimensional generalization of num sums. And the, the nums equation now um, is an equation that involves R many uh, numbers in 0, 1, and it says 1 minus qi is the product of qj to the aij from 1 to r, from 1 to r. But symbolically, I write it like this. And the element of the block group is the sum of qi's from 1 to r, and you can prove that this is a well-defined element of the block group because uh, this is a symmetric matrix and using the wedge product is an exterior product. Okay, so, and when I say we have shown it, we have shown it for arbitrary run, not just run one. Okay, um, now let me make some remark. I gave you an example already Due to Ramanujan, a rank one example of a modular num sum. The question is, among rank one examples, how many of them are modular? So here is a remark. Um, it is rare to be modular. It is rare for a num sum to be modular. How rare? Well, for rank one, here's the complete list of modular num sums. So A is either two B is either 0 or 1, 2 or 1, 0, a half, minus a half, and 1 half, 0, or 1. There are seven cases. Only those are modular and all others are not. Okay. Uh, ooh, I thought I had more. Oh yeah. Okay, that's for rank one. I mean, first of all, if these are modular, you have to prove they are modular, and that involves uh, art of of Q series identities. Um, but it's 
more important how do you um, how do you use modularity to figure out what are the values of A? I will talk about that in a moment. That was the case for rank one. For rank two, well, for rank two, the modular ones come in a one parameter family plus about 20 except, I mean, sporadic cases. In case you're bored, let me give you a sporadic case. That one. For that one, it's modular. Okay, next remark. Yeah, they're the ABC of the modular, of, of the num sum. A num sum is determined not by the A, but also by a B and a C. <clears throat> These, A, B, C. So, right. 4 and squared plus 1 and plus 1 is the last point. Here? No, no, the, the last Here. Point. Oh, this is A. For this value of A, there is a B and a C for which it is modular. <clears throat> okay. Um, here's a remark. If you have a num sum which is modular, then what? So if F of ABC is modular, Remember that this defines a function analytic inside the unit disk. So if it's analytic inside the unit disk, we can look at the asymptotic expansion as you approach 1, as you approach a classical limit. You cannot just plug it 1 because there is a quantum n factorial in the denominator. And when you put 1, it's going to vanish to order n. And you're summing from n equal 1 to infinity. So that's a very bad idea. But that is the point that you should be approaching. So if it's modular, this asymptotic expansion um, is an exponential of minus L of R element of the block group. Um, and then C0 plus C1 h bar and 0 times h bar square and 0 times h bar cube and so on, all other zeros. So in other words, if you have a modular num sum, the asymptotic expansion at q equal 1 is a terminating, terminating series where L is a specific map which replaces element of the block group by complex numbers and is defined by the Rogers dialogarithm. Is that some sort of national anthem? Um, okay, so anyway, and uh, just for fun, the Rogers dialogarithm of uh, the golden ratio is uh, pi square minus pi square over 60. Okay, so if it's modular, then the asymptotics is terminated. And moreover, and moreover, the value of the element is a rational multiple of pi square. Now you may say, so what? Well, this is great. The reason this is great is because if I want to prove, for instance, that this sum is not modular, what can I do? I can numerically compute asymptotic expansion at q equal 1 and realize it's not terminating, or I can compute 
the value of the Rogers Day logarithm at the solution of the equation 1 minus q is equal to q cubed. That is a cubic equation, a unique solution, say 0, 1. And uh, compute it, you know, to 100 digits, which is easy. And C, divide up, you divide by pi squared. Does it look like a rational number? Does it not? Of course, that is not the proof. However, it cuts down the space of possible A's dramatically. And it is not cutting down that, you know, led to the case that for round two, you, you find about 20 sporadic ones by cutting down the possible values of all two by two matrices using these two numerical criteria. But these are just numerical criteria. Okay, um, how about the converse to Nunn's conjecture? Well, it is actually not true, so luckily Nunn's conjecture goes only one way and not the other way. Um, so converse to Nunn's conjecture not true. Uh, uh, what does converse mean? It says, if something is modular, then an element in the block group is torsion. If an element in the block group is torsion, is it modular? And the answer is maybe yes, maybe no. So for the case 4, 1, 1, 1, you get a torsion element, which is a series which is actually modular. But for another example, for another example, um, of A equals um, not any, but three halves, one half, one half, and three halves. This is torsion element, but it is not modular. Actually, uh, here it's not, and here it is, and I have to change my numbers. Uh, eight. <clears throat> okay, so the converse is really not true. Um, let me make another kind of remark, the final one of the kind of the remarks. Uh, so the remark is that uh, num sums. behave much like, and here you can wake up, much like the Schaif invariant of what? Of ideal triangulations. So an ideal triangulation has solution to neumann zagier equations, gluing equations, well, here you have non equation, and non equation and Neumann Zagier is sort of the same type of equation. Here you have a rank R, which is the rank. Here is R is the number of tetrahedra, ideal tetrahedra that you use. Um, there is an element of the block group in both cases. The element of the block, block group has a volume, um, and and to be torsion in the block group, it means that you are in the zero volume case. Now, which ideal triangulations of three manifolds have zero volume? This is a rare phenomenon, as we know in topology, because a random <coughs> ideally triangulated three manifold is going to be hyperbolic. It is going to have volume. They are very rare, the ones that are non hyperbolic. Okay, so, but this is just a parenthetical remark, although it did play a role to the proof. So, at this point, I explain to you what is a num sum, what is a modular function, what is an element of the block group, some superficial connection between Nunn's equations and Neumann's gear equations and, and triangulated knot complements. So, 
from now on, I could give two talks. Talk number one, the story behind the proof. And talk number two, the proof. I come from a country that believes in democracy, so I want to take a poll. Okay, so each one of you should raise their hand. I don't want people undecided. How many people want to hear the story behind the proof? Raise your hand. Okay, how many people want to hear the proof? Raise your hand. Yeah, about a third of you have no opinion. That is terrible. You know, I've actually made up my mind about which story I will tell you. If this was a Gelfan seminar, I would give both talks simultaneously with many interruptions and colorful remarks. But unfortunately, this is not a Gelfan seminar. I, only, I also have less than 10 minutes. The story behind the proof has very important and interesting numbers and is a full line of discoveries, four years, independent numerical discoveries. But I will not tell you about that. I will only say something about the proof. Okay. Okay, so... All right. So how can you prove such... It's typical for democracy. You make people vote? Yes! <laughs> you lived in France and you know what that implies. In Greece it's even worse. You would have students occupying the building here and telling you that you are not allowed and stuff like that. Believe me, it's, it's bad. Okay. So I'll just make a few statements. Okay, maybe before I tell you the proof, I'll give you some ingredients about the proof. The proof uses uh, a tau and Galois cohomology. Okay, it uses something called the cyclic quantum dialog. It uses the main theorem of Voivodsky and Ross. Fields metal theorem that a certain map is an injection. Um, it uses um, a paper from 1993 of Kashaev Um, mm, Mangazev Strogan. which predated the Kashaev invariant by very little. The same time that Nam formulated his modulated conjecture. So there is an identity in that paper that we're going to use. Um, of course, I don't have time to explain everything, so maybe I should just, uh, what can I say? Maybe I should uh, just... I should just say what is the cyclic quantum dialogue. Oh, and uh, a theorem on the asymptotics of num sums at roots of unity. So, asymptotics of num sums at all roots of unity, not one. So that is a theorem that I have jointly with um, Zakir. Okay, maybe I should say what is the cyclic quantum dialog. It is a special function, so z z zeta is a primitive nth root of unity and p zeta of x is capital X is the product of 1 minus little x
where little x is an nth root of capital X. Okay, so you may say, well, which x, which which nth root? Yes, indeed, there is a uh, there is a kind of ambiguity. This is the cyclic quantum dialogue, cyclic quantum dialogue. So if if um, if you use the cyclic quantum dialogue algorithm, see, I'm not going to be able to even. Well, what can I say? You know what? I cannot, th there are six theorems that I have to just state, just theorems behind the proof. So I'm not going to do anything, you know? However, I will close. Ah, maybe I should write uh, the, the formula for the identity of Kashaev and Mangazev and company. The identity says that um, that a certain truncated state sum times z to the k after you raise it in the nth power it is a product of um, this thing, R, 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 R. So a product of terms like that is an nth power. This is an algebraic identity. We're going to use this algebraic identity to uh, define a map from the block group. Mm. No, it's not going to happen. You know what? I'll just say one thing here. So, in 2011, there was a number theory conference in Obrovolfo, and Frank Calagari wrote in that conference, we conjecture that a function which cannot be defined is equal to a function which cannot be computed. function that cannot be computed is the Chern class map of Voivodsky, and the function that cannot be defined, it was a function that at that time cannot be defined, but now it can be defined using the uh, cyclic quantum day logarithm and descend to an element of the broad group because of this identity. So, and in addition, these two are supposed to be equal, and at that time, you cannot even compare them, and now we can by using reduction to finite fields. There is a last bit here, which is a reduction to finite fields. From number fields, we reduce to finite fields, and we use sufficiently many primes. How many? Well, a positive density set of primes given to us for free by another famous Russian mathematician by the name of Chepotalov. So we use Chebotar density. So sorry I failed completely to even state the theorems. That's it. Any questions? The conjecture concerns modular functions. Yes. What about uh, modular forms of other weights? Um, if an sum is a modular form, it has to be of weight zero because of the shape of the hypergeometric series. Uh, moreover, the characters of Virasoro, if you put them all together, they 
they make a representation of the modular um, of SL2Z, the full modular group, but they're all of weight zero. More questions? In the talk, uh, it is, uh, explains the uh, relation between non -sum, um, sums and the uh, cost um, uh, invariant, uh, and uh, also the triangulations for three manifolds and uh, uh, the hyperbolic volume equal to zero. This part I cannot understand very well. Can you okay. explain again? So, so let me. So I, I gave the example of the Ramanujan function. Actually, maybe not. Maybe let me take another one, like a non-modular one. Here is a non-modular one uh, that has an element of the block group like this. It corresponds to a fictional ideal triangulation of a manifold that requires only one ideal tetrahedron and the gluing equations are given by that. And what I also did not say is that if you look at the asymptotic expansion of this function at q equal 1, you get a formal power series in h bar, which is identical to the formal power series of the Kashaif invariant, if it did come from an ideal triangulation. One ideal tetrahedron and one shape called capital Q that satisfies this gluing equation. So, any more questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker again.